in this episode of Investors and Operators, I sit down with David Thorpe, who's the CEO and founder of Upperline Health. David, it is awesome to have you here. I'm excited to interview operators uh, for this podcast. You have an amazing story about growing this business with your team in a very fast pace. So can you just kind of start off with giving a high level overview about what Upperline Health is? Yeah, Jordan. Thanks for thanks for having me, uh, and um, pleasure to pleasure to be here. Um, so, so really simple terms. We're really just a large specialty physician practice. Uh, we're currently in six, about to be in eight or so states, uh, and our mission really is to disrupt um, specialty healthcare and, and bring value based care um, to to specialty care, and so. Specifically, we're, we're focused mostly on lower extremity issues right now, so wound care, podiatry, um, uh, vascular care as well, and uh, and again, looking at value-based care and in, in, in more um, sort of narrow segments uh, with, within the healthcare system. Cool. So you, you started the business around five years ago? That's, that's right. Uh, in, in my basement in a couple of coffee shops, my basement... Uh, Caught on fire, uh, so we uh, not not because of the business, but because of a space heater, uh, and and then the banded ship to to a few coffee shops around town. Uh, so, but yeah, about, about five years ago. Yeah, well, let's give some facts and figures just to kind of set the stage a little bit for the audience here. When you started, like how many locations, how many uh, physicians, how many employees, and then you know fast forward to five years later, where are we at today? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, my goal always uh, was to, as I said, do value-based care, but try to do it um, on the back of a more traditional healthcare services roll-up, because um, uh, most of healthcare is getting consolidated, uh, and a lot of that's not good for the, the healthcare system. It's not necessarily good for society. Uh, you know, they're, they're they're aggregating and pushing things together without necessarily thinking of, hey, how can we. Uh, uh, you know, create more value for for the healthcare system or for the patient and consumer. And so, um, I, I lived and worked in a value based care world. A company called Aspire Health, um, as did a lot of our executives. Uh, and and so, I, I, I was actually still at Aspire. Um, our old CEO, uh, who's who's still a friend, um, allowed me to to give up my um, my office space, my parking spot for about six months. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and do both, uh, which, um, you know, is, is a nice way, I guess, uh, for my wife from a, uh, income perspective to start a, a company from a, a stress perspective, probably, uh, not the best, best way to do it, uh, and, and, and have sort of two startups going simultaneously. Um, but, uh, so, so hold on a second, it, but wait a second, yeah. like, honestly, you know, you wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was good. It was fun. Uh, yeah, you know, it was. It was a wild time, and we were having kids at the same time. How, um, how many were you up to at that point five years ago? So we were uh, on to our our second, uh, and that's when the house fire came. And so everything was just kind of incremental chaos, actually, at that point. <laughs> uh, Does it reach that threshold above which it just yeah. all is the same? Yeah, no, it's exactly right. Like I, uh, so uh, this is actually one of our board members told me this uh, analogy for kids, but it's also true for startups. I think uh, the difference between like a third and fourth kid, we have four kids, uh, is like adding a, a banana to your smoothie. Um, you, you, you can kind of taste it, like you know it's there, but like you can't really taste the banana in your smoothie, right? And it's like, <laughs> it's, it's, like, little thing, it's like, yeah, like, <laughs> it's a little more chaotic, but it was, I don't know, it hadn't really changed things all that much. Uh, yeah, so so that was uh, doing both at the same time, uh, and and it allowed me to yeah to to really think and, and hone this value based care uh, pitch um, uh, for for specialty care, and, and, and sort of the idea behind it came from um, I, I kept hearing health plans uh, they would flag a lot of these chronic wound care patients for us at our previous company, um, and and we weren't really built to to tend to those patients. Uh, by the time we got them, it was pretty late in the process. And so um, that's when sort of the, uh, the, the light bulb went off to start looking at, at wound care um, and, and then saying, hey, can I do wound care in the back of a more traditional healthcare services roll up, which ultimately um, led me to start with podiatry. And so, um, as I said, uh, initially bought um, uh, doing both, both companies at the same time, uh, bought a podiatry clinic in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, 
it was two doctors at the time. I think this was February. It'll so it'll be five years uh, in this February, I think. Um, and uh, it was we knew nothing about podiatry. Uh, it was me and one other guy from from Aspire. Um, and it was three docs before we bought it. One of the docs actually left when we bought it. And, uh, and that's how we, we started in, in Birmingham. Uh, we're based at Nashville. Neither of us lived there. Uh, that's where I grew up, actually. Uh, wanted to get in, you know, a new podiatry for the wound care aspect and have this hypothesis. Uh, so we, we actually uh, posted on, there's a sort of a big uh, newsletter for podiatry. We basically said, hey, who wants to sell? Uh, and then I had some friends, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, some friends that are medical sales reps uh, who one of them was in the OR with podiatrists who wanted to sell. And uh, he called me and he knew about this. And so that's, uh, that's actually how we, we started. Uh, we had, you know, no, uh, you know, really inside knowledge of, of what the industry was. I had no way to vet the doctors, um, you know, certainly not to the extent that we do now. Um, and, uh, and took, you know, uh, sort of the, the leap into the, the deep end of the swimming pool. Um, so yeah. start off one business or one location, two physicians. Yeah. And, uh, today, how many locations are there? How many physicians, how many employees? And then we can kind of rewind and, and, and break down kind of each chapter of the story. Yeah. So, uh, initially we bought it, yeah, it was two physicians, maybe eight employees, um, uh, and now we're, you know, probably 150 physicians, I think we'll be, um, edging up to 200 physicians here by the end of the year, um, 850 employees, I think today. So probably, you know, 150 or, or so, maybe a thousand, um, by, by the end of the year, we've basically doubled in size or more than doubled in size, uh, every year over the last four years, um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, I think we'll, we'll hopefully continue to, to grow and, and, and build, you know, to, to grow at a fast pace. Um, uh, yeah, well, let's, let's rewind a little bit to the beginning and like, how'd you even finance the deal? Yeah. I mean, it, um, I, I, a lot of independent sponsors out there, um, you know, regardless of the industry, you know, deal structuring and who to partner with, et cetera, is, is always top of mind. Um, so if, if, you know, love to learn kind of how you thought about it and how you went about it, and then we can kind of go into, you know, chapter one, what were some of the challenges just in that first phase of the business five years ago? And then what was the, the next chapter? Yeah. So, um, we, we went a non-traditional route in terms of, of starting the business, uh, um, and in part because I'm by nature, probably a contrarian. Uh, uh, and we had just come from a business that was more traditional, sort of VC to PE backed, um, uh, business and, and knew that world and, and, and lived in that world. Uh, but, but wanted to do it kind of the old traditional way, which was, um, me and uh, my other partner, uh, with uh, a little bit of our money and a bunch of personal guarantees with a local bank here in Nashville that only has one branch here in Nashville. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's probably a story that you, you could have, uh, probably the only way to start a business, you know, 80 years ago or, or 60 years ago before, uh, you know, sort of professional, um, sponsors e existed and that's how we did it for really the first year. So, um, uh, between again, our, our capital and, and larger the, the bank, uh, they were very personal, you know, again, old school, personal banking relationships. Uh, he still jokes, um, he still writes me a Christmas card every year and, and, uh, you know, jokes about our, our old headquarters, one of the, the coffee shops down the road. Um, I never invited them to my basement, uh, even before it burned down. Uh, and, you know, he was paying attention to the business and, and, and the way, you know, that, that a, a sponsor might, but, but also with a little bit of a different banking hat on, obviously. And, um, so we, we, we got the, the initial two doctors, we grew up to three in Birmingham. Uh, and then we, we basically found some, um, you know, smaller one doc shop tuck-ins um, uh, throughout Alabama over a year's time period uh, in, in the Tennessee that, that we financed um, ourselves uh, by and large. And, um, uh, you know, it, 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 there was good and bad with it. I think uh, the good was I lived the small business owner, uh, world, you know, of, of looking at cash in your bank account, 
um, you know, thinking about really small dollar items uh, and, and how that impacts uh, the, the business, um, which, which I wanted to have that experience. Um, I don't want to do that uh, necessarily again, but it was, it was a great experience um, to do. Uh, it also makes it much easier for me to relate to doctors who are selling or, or any small business owner who's selling. Um, Cause I, you know, I, I did live in that, that world. Um, and my level of appreciation for small business owners is uh, so much higher than, than it was before. Yeah. Um, well, can you give us some insight into what it was like at home? You know, the discussions that you and your wife were having kind of making this business decision. Um, I, I know that when, we started our journey in 2016, you know, we had more in the bank than we did in 2018. <laughs> <laughs> it was not up and to the right. And it, yeah. one of the key takeaways that I had that I did incorrectly was not consistently communicating to my wife who was, you know, being a, she was a lawyer at the time and funding our business and our bank account almost went to zero. And yeah. then, I mean, now we're in the business together. So we share in the up and the downs, but one of the things I did incorrectly was not communicating on a monthly basis. Hey, here's just what's going on in the business. Yeah. And it wasn't intentional. It was because so much of my time was just trying to keep the business alive. I forgot that you have to make time to communicate and over communicate with the family. I mean, that was one of my early experiences, but I'm curious uh, what it was like for you and kind of what you guys were going through in the first year is, you know, really going through this as a family. Yeah. It's really interesting question. Um, So, uh, so she actually pushed me to do it. Um, I had been talking about starting a business for a really long time, actually rewinding my uh, sort of motivation to start a business started uh, probably 10 years before that um, because I had two great leaders and mentors uh, and I used to work in the, the state of Tennessee's government, the governor's office. Um, and I saw what leadership did uh, within organizations in terms of them feeling empowered, um, uh, valued, what that meant as husbands, wives, community members. And so I was always talking about starting a business because I just thought that was so cool um, having experienced it firsthand, like how having a, a job where people are excited to come to work more often than not, uh, with, with that does to an individual. And so I was always talking about it, uh, at the previous company, even though I started at that company when there was you know, four or five corporate employees. So, you know, at the very beginning as well, uh, you know, I was still always saying, Hey, you know, what do I want to do? I, I'm a, a two to three bad idea a day person. Um, and, and I would throw a lot of those up against the wall with, with my wife. Um, and it definitely got to be a time where she, you know, was like, Hey, you're either going to do this or you're not. Right. And she pushed me actually really, really hard. Um, which, uh, without that, I probably wouldn't have done it. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think that, that helped in, in a lot of ways, uh, um, set a context for the stress of the first year. Um, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit to when, when we actually started up our line, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about that. I think the, um, the biggest takeaway that, that I would have is, uh, so I'm, I internalize stress, uh, I think, and she would actually probably say very effectively, like you have no, it's really hard to figure out if like something existential is happening or if it's the best day at the office. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the mechanisms I, I have to do that is I don't talk about it. Right. And so you can't actually tell and my demeanor might look exactly the same. Um, and, and so I think, uh, early on, you know, that was almost a coping mechanism for me, right. To figure out how to, how to push through all this. Uh, and, and she had to learn how to interact with that as well. And, and I think it, it actually probably came to head. We went, uh, maybe one of, because we keep having babies, we went to, uh, New York for a baby moon. And I was so stressed that like I wasn't, it, it, that I had internalized it to the point where it bubbled over. And I don't actually remember what was going on in the business, but it, and I don't think it was anything existential. It was just the day to day. And the trip was awful. Like I couldn't enjoy a single thing. I didn't sleep. We were staying in a nice hotel. And I didn't sleep at all. And finally, you know, that was the first time we had the conversation of like, hey, like what is stressing you out? And it was, and again, it wasn't any one thing, right? It was like, no, it's this, this, this. And it's like, Oh yeah, I have a list of a hundred things that I'm worrying about that no one else is worrying about, which is why I'm staying up at night worrying about these things. Um, and, and one of the, the takeaways that that I've had, you know, from then and and uh, really 
in the last, I'd say, two years, um, uh, you know, with with a young family, um, and and one of the ways that that I have found, um, you know, dealing with sort of the, the both the stress and the paces uh, um, is is been both more manageable, but also more enjoyable, uh, is to kind of open uh, sort of the concept of work-life balance to me. I always, um, I, I now think is is uh, dumb, at least for me personally. It doesn't benefit me. Uh, it all bleeds together, anyways. I like my work. I like my life. Um, and and not thinking of these things as two separate entities that I have to build walls up uh, around uh, has been extremely freeing, right? And so me doing an email, my wife asking about it, me being able to answer, step out in the call and she can hear the call um, and, and just not having a sense of like, you know, that's me neglecting my family or, um, you know, that's me, you know, not enjoying my free time uh, and, and kind of getting away from that over the last, again, three years as, as a part of that sort of revelation uh, has been, uh, you know, hugely helpful for me. And I, and, and I think it's actually, again, made it so much more enjoyable. And I would say my wife would say the same thing. Like she now knows what's happening, right? Because I talk about it. We have, you know, we go to dinner with other people in the business and are trying to even do more of that sort of stuff and have spouses and, and you know, have it be more of a, of a community because our, our work is, you know, I, I believe a huge part of our sort of societal connection for a lot of us. Um, and, and so rather than trying to push that off and separate these two things, uh, you know, I, I think I, I have found by combining them actually um, just makes it easier for spouse, makes it easier for family, and, and has, has, has been uh, probably the, the biggest personal or, or uh, uh, as it relates to my family um, learning experience and, and uh, of, of the last you know, four or five years. How, how do you, with that same idea about kind of putting up a guard and internalizing, you know, the ups and the downs, how does that translate over to your team and the employees? So, you know, I think that there's this balance between sharing a lot and they feel like I'm part of this. Yeah. I'm, I, I see the ups and the downs yeah. versus sharing too much. You're like, well, how is my job safe? Yeah. Um, you know, we've been at a, a good position the past you know, 18 months with the business and we're growing significantly. But I remember the first year, you know, I, I aired on the side of sharing more about our finances, our bank account. And I found that it really, I think it allowed nobody to have any surprises. Yeah. And they were, but they actually got more involved in the journey. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious how, you know, what you were discussing, you know, how that kind of translates to how you interact with the team. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, um, it's a good question. I mean, I think, it, it certainly is a balance. Uh, and, and I kind of think of probably two types of, I, I do think vulnerability is, is important to build connections as a, just a general human matter. Uh, you know, I, it's actually quite easy for me to be, or I think it is, my wife might not, not say this, but uh, it feels quite easy for me to be personally vulnerable, right? I can, I can I'm an open book. I'm happy to share things um, uh, to people if they ask, and sometimes they might not ask, but I'll still share it. Uh, but, but I think, <laughs> You know, that 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 does allow some level of vulnerability, right? And and, and build some of those connections. Uh, you know, I think the the company vulnerability um, is is definitely a uh, uh, you know a, a sort of more more of a balancing act. Uh, the, the analogy I used really early on is, um, uh, you know, when you start the business and things are still more existential, you're um, charging the hill uh, and, and having everyone. Uh, follow you and you're not actually sure if it's the right hill, uh, but you probably shouldn't tell everyone that, right? Because people might be getting shot next to you. Um, and the last thing you want to tell them it's the wrong hill, right? Sorry, guys. I don't actually know if this is where yeah, we're this, supposed to go. This, we should be, we should be <laughs> going the wrong direction. Keep but... on going. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I think the general directional trends early on, um, you know, I, I always trusted my gut and, and instincts and, and those proved to be true. Um, uh, and so I, I tended to not share a lot of, of my, um, uh, you know, strategic concerns uh, or, or uh, concerns. Um, what I don't have an issue sharing, and, and, and in fact, we're, we're trying to do more of this, uh, is like individual performance of a clinic, you know, financial or 
um, or, or clinical or operational. Um, you know, I do, you I mean do with believe the management team or do you mean across other clinics? So people in Georgia can see what's going on in Florida and we're like, Hey, what's going on here? How can we, yeah, that both. Kind of yeah, right. both. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's interesting and, uh, you know, sponsor backed companies, I think sometimes uh, I suspect are actually probably more guarded about that stuff a lot of times. Um, uh, and, and that's just my, you know, my, my sense is they're less, sometimes transparent about that because you've bought companies and, and they don't actually know, you know, you're behind the curtain doing what with this business that you're buying. Uh, and I think, um, you know, for, for us, at least our, our businesses, you know, I realized pretty quickly that most of our, the doctors, the people in clinics, um, they were small business owners. They actually get all of this stuff. Uh, the great thing about podiatry and wound care is like it's fragmented. And so a lot of these guys have, and gals have, have, have lived that life um, and they've got a lot of really valuable insights, uh, but they don't, they don't know if the clinic's doing well or, or, or poorly, like they're not going to raise their hand and, and offer to help, right? They're not going to stay, um, you know, uh, late at night to try to fix those things. Um, but they are people that, that, you know, like that. And, and so I think we, I, I sort of quickly realized that. Um, and, and I think we're, we're trying to do more of, more of that even, uh, you know, as, as we keep growing, um, within the company, but, you know, our doctors, our clinics, um, our, you know, our, our doctors get rankings every single, um, month, uh, you know, and, and see where they, where they, um, where they stand and, and, and whatnot. And so, um, you know, I, I think on an operational sort of fundamental basis, I, I am a big fan of, of doing that, um, on a, you know, strategic uh, is this the right hill? Um, you know, I, I did not uh, sort of say, hey, here, here are my existential fears about this, right? Like, here's where this goes uh, to zero. Um, uh, you know, early on, I, I didn't I didn't share that um, uh, you know, all that much, um, but in part because I don't know that the people around me were going to fix that. Uh, yeah. You know, so so there, yeah. there's probably lots of reasons. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that that balance of and taking that risk and is it worth the upside reward for loyalty and yep. feel like a team and they're going through it and like and, and you know do you have that that core team that's like hey it's okay if we don't know we're gonna go like yep. get the right people on the bus the wrong people off the bus and then figure out we're gonna where we're gonna go the whole Jim Collins concept yeah um, but it depends on who you have on the team and if they're if they want that type of ride for that part in their career that's right um, that's right yeah some of the people you know. Uh, again, if you're growing via, you know, de novo and mergers and acquisitions, like some of the people will sell because they want to be a part of a bigger, safer organization, right? Yep. Yep. Um, it may be in, in, in a market where people that are here in Nashville, they want to be a part of a fast growth startup, right? And so telling them something that feels risky and existential, like they, they, they actually bought into that. And, they, yeah. and to your point, like they might get energized by that, like, hey, man, I'm going to fix this. Like we're going to, you know, lock together and, and solve this. Well, let's talk about how you have grown through through acquisitions and just kind of maintained uh, the infrastructure of the business and the culture of the business. I mean, from a high level, what's about how many deals have you have you done in the past five years? And yeah. then kind of walk us through, you know, how you were able to do that sustainably. Maybe some of the hiccups along the road, and you know, kind of where you guys are at today. Yeah. So I think we've done low twenties, maybe 23 or so deals. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's probably, um, we're probably on pace to add like 50 doctors via M and a, a year. Um, uh, you know, our, our sort of second phase and third phase, um, which we can get into with, with value-based care. You know, the, the goal was, to buy this again and, and create a value-based care system. And, and one of the really cool things now is we, we're, we're at that point. We take a step back and we see two, you know, probably 200,000 patients a year, which is a huge volume of patients. Uh, and so now we've, we've got a captive audience that we want to you know, add value to the healthcare system with. And, and again, that's sort of the next couple of phases where we'll do more de novo and, and sort of organic growth. Um, yeah, probably even bigger, hopefully, than, than the M&A side. Uh, uh, you know, early on, uh, before we have our infrastructure, right? Like we're actually watching the clinics, learning the clinics. Um, it was a weird 
dynamic, uh, I'll say, particularly early uh, when before we had institutional capital, you know, and, and then and, and I was a small business owner, right? We would buy these things and I would walk in and I, I owned it, right? Like, you know, I was on the line, uh, uh, me and Stephen were, you know, our, 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 our credit at least was on the line. Um, and, and, and we would walk in and there would be a bunch of things you'd want to change, right? They've got junk on the wall. They've got, you know, a messy sign-in sheet. They've got whatever it is, right? Ugly plants that are fake that I don't like, wallpaper I don't like. Um, but that's that doctor's practice, right? What I actually bought was that doctor and I want him to be happy. I want him to be, you know, sold into the bigger picture, um, and, and you have to walk this balancing act of, you know, Hey, if I change his sign in sheet, um, they might lose their mind, right? Like they've had the same sign in sheet for 25 years and that feels like I'm taking their autonomy from them. Right. And so, uh, you know, early on we were, we were really careful about that, um, because the most important goal was, you know, continue to operate the business that we, we bought, um, uh, you know, uh, as effectively as, as is what we hoped it would be. Uh, and then once you get enough of these, you build your infrastructure and then you're starting to get economies of scale and, and putting them on your platforms and you decide, hey, here's what an upper line box looks like. Uh, and we're still determining all of that right now, I would say. Um, uh, but, but so it was a, you know, a sort of a, a slow process for us actually of uh, you know, when you're bootstrapped, uh, you, you're, you're watching them and, and waiting and, and kind of learning. Uh, you get institutional capital which is three years ago uh, for us. And, uh, you know, we, we say, um, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of things that, hey, if we invest in this technology or these people, right, we can really standardize these sorts of things. Um, uh, and, and so that's, you know, sped a lot of it up. Um, but even as you do big, you know, bigger acquisitions, that's still true on, on you know, a scale for 30 doctors as it, as it was for one doctor. And you want to be careful about, pulling out the rug and, and changing things and having poor integrations. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think over the last, again, really three years, we've gotten fairly good at integrations. Uh, um, you know, the, 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 the hiccups and, and bumps along the road um, have come from, uh, uh, it's, it's actually to your culture question. Um, you know, the, the only golden rule was do no harm. If I bought something that, you know, spits off a million dollars a year, uh, we need to make sure it doesn't go below a million dollars a year is the first goal. Uh, and so, um, you know, operators and everybody are, are thinking that. And so, you know, you can easily have a year go by and have grown a lot. And you've got, you know, individual pockets that have, um, you know, strong strains of, of their old business, right? And it hasn't um, been, been sort of unified. Um, you know, COVID actually helped a fair amount in, in starting to create a cohesive culture because, yeah, there's 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 comfort in numbers and, and we started creating more of that culture. Um, but we're really just now starting to really push that out across all of the clinics, right? We've got some that have migrated faster than others and, and some that haven't. Uh, and, and I think that the hiccup, or not hiccup, but you know, I, I wouldn't have done it differently, um, uh, is that you don't have a consistent um, employee experience across the organization yet for us, uh, because it's there's still the the, the historical uh, you know, sort of remnants of, of that of that practice. And so, um, you know, and it, it gets a balancing act, right? Like we don't want to become, our, our goal is not to become some mega bureaucratic uh, system, right? Like I, you know, people work for us, people come to our doctor's offices because uh, they want an intimate personal uh, relationship with a, with a physician and that's what we can offer them. Um, and so, you know, standardizing, customer experience, employee experience, and the things that matter, uh, but allowing variability where, uh, you know, where, where it's fine, right? Um, and, and that goes from, you know, uh, you know how, the, how the, the clinic is stocked potentially to um, how you might use your medical assistant versus this doctor um, to, uh, you know, even the types of patients you might see. And so, you know, creating that, that balance is yeah. something that, that we're, um, yeah, you know, we will always struggle with, right. As, as we grow. Um, so. and, and it sounds like one of the, you know, it, it's an interesting trade-off of, you know, do you decide to go, if you're rolling up a bunch of 
companies, regardless of the industry, to buy then rebrand or yeah. buy and say, no, like you're relevant for this, for your, the Nashville region, you're relevant for the Charlotte region and you need to keep that. But then what is that? What is the upper line DNA? What is the upper yep. line culture that, you know, is across every organization, no matter if they're, you know, two physicians or 25 physicians. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, <clears throat> I, I'm just now starting to realize that in our organization about the importance of what values and principles mean, because I can't, Jing and I cannot be on every single project, Yep. but we have to be able to communicate and share with our team, you know, what is our brand? What is yep. the experience we want clients to have? And whether it's one person staffed or the whole team staffed and what are our values? Um, because that's what's scalable that makes me think about a book that has recently kind of had an impact on me, which was Daniel Pink's book, uh, Drive, Driven, Drive. Mm. Oh my God, I should probably know this because I just referenced it. But here's the big idea of Daniel Pink's book, which is um, the carrot and stick motivational framework of the past. You know, that works for an industrial uh, framework, an industrial mm. environment. But for professional services or things that require creativity that are not algorithmic, you know, if you make X widgets, you get Y uh, output and reward. Um, you know, that, that's actually, you know, that framework doesn't work. And what he proposes is this uh, map framework of mastery, autonomy, and purpose. And so, you know, it really was important for us to kind of start rethinking how we, you know, motivate ourselves. How do we motivate the team to make sure that we're, you know, this is something we spend eight plus hours a day on five days a week. People work weekends sometimes. And it's like, the thing that really sparked this for me was watching the WeWork documentary and putting, you know, the rise and big fall aside one of the things that the, the founder did that was amazing was he inspired people globally to work for a vision. It was like, how the heck did he do that? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we're trying to really think about is, you know, have a sustainable motivational framework and incentive framework, you know, with, with mastery, it it's feels incredible to see someone on the team, just crush it on the project that we had nothing to do with and they did it. And for them to fly back from a, you know, a, a shoot in Houston with a client and they did everything and you could see it. And like that, that to see them master that skill set, you know, really motivates us to want to continue to develop. And with mm -hmm. the autonomy, them doing it by themselves or with very, very little oversight, you know, that's a huge motivational thing. And then with purpose, one of the things that we do every Friday and sometimes multiple times a week is on our Slack channel, I'll just share a story from our clients on, you know, particular posts that we did that we knew had an impact on them personally. when we told a story because that, you know, we want to feel connected. It's not just a LinkedIn post, a video for another person in private equity or in the M&A market. It's, you know, that person's story about going from Cuba to East Germany and then escaping East Germany to come to America with $3,000 they had in their pocket that they earned at a toilet factory. Like, and then that person now is one of the co-founders of a large firm. Like we want to know that story, the motivation. And so that framework um, has really been helpful in kind of rethinking um, how we, you know, work with the team. Mm -hmm. um, and we're always trying to find new, you know, new ways to think about team development because now, you know, we have six employees, not, you know, 800 plus like you, but I mean, we're, we still, we, we face that the same the same challenge of we can't be everywhere. Yeah. And how do we make sure that what is important to us as a core team is spread throughout the organization, organization because this core team right now is the foundation upon which we build the next 25 people, the next 50 people. Yep. Yeah. No, it's interesting. We, we actually, uh, going back to your original question, um, you know, I have sensed it, and again, a lot of this maybe came from COVID, um, has sensed uh, sort of a, a longing and desire from our, 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 all of our doctors and our clinics um, to actually standardize more of this because they, they, want, they want a clear uh, you know, vision and mission. And our, I happen to think our, our mission is really exciting. Um, and it's much bigger than you know, just the 
the foot pain or the, the foot ulcer. Um, uh, and, and so I think, uh, you know, it, it, you obviously hear about integrations gone wrong all the time, right? We have clashes of, of two cultures and when we've done you know, 20 plus of these things, you could, you could imagine that that goes wrong, uh, you know, sort of uh, with the multiplier effect, but um, uh, you know, we've, again, the, the timing at this point for us feels really, really right to, to really start to push that message down even, even more intentionally. Um, you know, what I've told our internal marketing folks is um, I want to hear employees complain about the number of, of communications they're getting for us from us until I hear those complaints keep going, right? Like, yeah, you got your calendar, keep doing more. Um, because people need to hear that, yeah, they need to hear it seven times, right? And so seven times for each value, we've got, you know, four values, right? So that's a lot of emails, uh, you know, patient stories for them to hear. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, in some sense, you, you might, it's funny, so our, our daughter just started um, kindergarten at, a, at a, uh, a great kindergarten here in Nashville. And I don't, I don't know if uh, you guys get a bunch of school emails, but I mean, I get, I get like three a day. And yeah. In some sense, you know, I, I read 5% of them maybe, and I'm hoping my wife reads the other 95% and we'll flag it if it's something important. My daughter's pretty responsible. She'll probably flag it for me. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I, I even maybe it's not five, maybe it's 10%, but I pick up enough with 10% uh, and, and just the act of the communication. I actually now feel like it's like a, this, the school system is like a community and team and it will be our community because we have a bunch of kids the next, you know, 16, 17 years of our, you know, 16 years of our life. And so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, even though I might complain about it, it's like, no, no, it serves a great purpose. Right. And, and that's what I tell our marketing team is like, Hey, each of these things that, you know, you got to get it out at least seven times. And we've got a lot of messages I want to get out there. Right? It's not just our values and our mission. It's patient stories. It's employee success stories or customer service, whatever all those different things are. Um, and so keep pushing it until, you know, we hear enough employees complain that you're <laughs> overwhelming my inbox. Is, is the current <laughs> well, um, maybe to kind of uh, do some concluding thoughts, you know, what, what would you say would be the main message that sellers out there need to hear about what it's like to work with Upperline? You know, if, if they're, you know, in contact with you or they have not heard about you, like what's the, uh, you know, what's the pitch? Why should they work with help upper line? Yeah. So um, I, I think it comes back to the, uh, you know, so the, the larger mission of, of, uh, of trying to change value-based care and bring it to specialty care. So if you think of, you know, phase one of value-based care is, is largely focused on PCPs um, where they've taken risk and, and, you know, done a lot of great things. Um, but, you know, primary care is 60 to 70% of our healthcare system. Um, so you've got all these other specialists out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, the way a lot of folks interact with our healthcare system is not necessarily through the PCP. Um, and even aside from that, you've got a uh, majority of our office visits with really well-trained doctors um, who uh, can add more value to the system, who can, you know, catch diseases that are falling between the cracks, who can diagnose things earlier, get better care at lower costs. And so, uh, you know, I think the way we're going about this, I, I believe at least is, is novel from, from that aspect. And so, you know, where we are today is, as I said, we've got 200,000 patients of those, you know, more than half or, or 65 or older, huge percentage have diabetics, uh, have diabetes. Um, you know, you've got very expensive wound care patients, vascular care patients. And so as we keep growing, we're, you know, we've got this sort of growth engine that's, that's um, uh, yeah, I think at this point, um, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, fairly well established. Uh, and so we'll keep sort of capturing more patients via a non-traditional route, right? The traditional route's the PCP model. I'm not saying we're, we're trying to supplant the PCP. Um, in fact, we'll work very closely with, with a lot of these groups that are doing that. Um, uh, but, but I think it's novel in that you say, hey, you've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients. Um, and, and, you know, even if you take a small sliver of those who have wound, wounds that are very expensive or diabetic patients um, or fall risk patients, uh, you know, how do we now start creating models around each of those, right? So we're doing it around wound care. We're starting to do it around vascular care. Uh, and so I think, you yeah, know, that uh, we're only just scratching, I guess, the surface of, of um, you know, the, the, the sort of 
way that we can connect different specialists together uh, to get different value-based care in our healthcare system. And so, um, yeah, I think that's a, the, 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 the novel part about what we're doing, I believe. That's also what excites me. Um, you know, this isn't just a, a podiatry roll-up, which you could do for another 10 years. Uh, you know, it's, it's, hey, we did that because we've got a bunch of patients that we're trying to go upstream and, and, and do some, um, some cool things to, uh, to the healthcare system around. And, uh, and, and we succeeded, you know, in, in doing that uh, uh, in terms of acquiring all those patients and we're starting to succeed uh, in terms of the outcomes with it. And so that can go on for 50 years, right? I think, you know, the, the, the opportunity around that is, is huge, right? You know, podiatry is a $10 billion uh, you know, market. Wound care is, a, depending on how you measure it, a 40 to $90 billion market, right? Vascular, depending on how you measure it. So there's just these huge specialty markets that, that I think are, are untapped and, um, and you know, a, a lot of runway left on, on being able to, to, to capture some value within those. All right. So David, let's, let's, let's give the, the big reasons why a physician and a group of owners that you might be talking with in Kentucky, North Carolina, wherever it's going to be like, why should they work with you, the team and, and upper line health? What, what is special about upper line health? Yeah. So, um, where we're really different is our background is value-based care, trying to transform healthcare. So um, yes, we've you know grown really quickly. We're the biggest podiatry employer. We'll hopefully soon be the biggest uh, you know outpatient wound care uh, employer as well um, within the country. We've got all the infrastructure and, and, and whatnot, and I think we're very good at, at running clinics. Um, but we look at healthcare a lot bigger than just the four walls of a clinic and just banging together doctors. Uh, you know, we, we're interested in, in, in folks that really want to transform the healthcare. Everyone picks up the news every day and, and reads what's happening, right, with the cost. And we see it in our premiums every year. Uh, it's just something has got to give. And uh, people that want to be a part of that uh, are joining our team. Uh, and, and they're getting the benefits of, you know, the, the large professional organization as well. But I think there's, there's a mission and, and vision behind all of this. Uh, and, and that's why I started this. That's why we are, we're all here, uh, which, which I think is unique and, and also makes it a lot uh, more enjoyable and, uh, and, and fun for, for folks as, as, as they join the upper line team. There we go. And if, uh, if physicians and owners are interested in, in, in connecting with you, what, what's the best way to, to, to reach out? Yeah, probably just uh, email dthorpe at upperlinehealth.com. Um, and that's T H O R P E. So D four. That's right. Upperlinehealth.com or on the LinkedIn. Yep. All right. Well, we've covered a ton of ground in this, and we could probably do like one episode on each chapter, the trials yeah. and tribulations. But I, <laughs> thanks a lot for 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 sharing this. Uh, and please tell your wife uh, that she is a champ for partnering with, uh, an entrepreneur <laughs> and I, I know, like, same story with like my, my wife, uh, Jing, who's now my business partner, you know, she's, she, she's the one who really also encouraged me to not go get a job, but to start a business. Oh, yeah. We didn't want to wake up at, you know, 80 years old and realize like, eh, you know what should have done this should have yeah. tried something that we want to do, but we didn't have the guts to go off and did it. We did. And, you know, you know, it's just incredible to have partners who are supportive like that, you know, in our journey. So congrats again. It's been an amazing uh, journey that you've had and look forward to see what's in the future.